Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Chalens. I'm the Dean of the College at Georgetown University, and I'm pleased to welcome you to um, this series on racial justice in the university, which um, we've titled Such a Time as This. The, the, the title comes from a quotation from scripture uh, from the book of Esther, and the passage really um, hints at the notion that people who are in certain positions of privilege or have a perch of privilege have a real responsibility to use that privilege for the right reasons um, and to do the kind of work that we need to do at any given moment in society to help all of us. And I think we've certainly been in one of those extended moments uh, for a long time. I would say in the more immediate sense, the tragic killings of Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, among many others, have spurred uh, a very visceral recognition of the um, deeply baked in systemic injustices in US society, the deep systemic presence of anti-Black racism in US society. And I think in a larger sense, um, at least for the last few years, there's been a consciousness that we need to think about our history in the United States especially, but then also globally in ways that include everybody, not, not the least um, Black people. Um, the presence of anti-Black racism is a U.S. phenomenon, it's structural, but it is also a global phenomenon, as our friends and colleagues in the School of Foreign Service are now um, discussing as well as they've started a new initiative. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, I'm very happy that we're starting this series. I think that what it means really is as we, all of this is about the kind of stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, right? And who gets counted in those stories and whose experience doesn't get counted in those stories. So as we try to reframe things to be a more responsible to facts, right? The fact that we know that, you know, the date 1619 is as if not more crucial in American history as the date 1776, right? And as we think on a global level too about the, the, the great interconnection of all different kinds of communities with each other, we want to be telling as inclusive stories as possible and as we can. So, so all of this is to say that I think there's a lot of different work we have to do in society to get ever closer to the goal of racial justice. And there are different spheres of different things that we can do. There's the political sphere, um, you know, there, there are cultural spheres, and of course there's the educational sphere. And what are the kinds of things that we do in the educational sphere? Well, we, we, we do research and we teach. So, you know, just so everyone knows the college is going to be launching um, an anti-Black racism course uh, starting in the spring that, that my colleague, um, uh, Professor Soika Colbert, who's also the Vice Dean of Faculty, has really done the work for. We're going to be doing that as a, a sort of pilot to see if, how, how and in what ways it's best to do more of that going forward. Um, but there's also research. And I think what this series is really about is, you know, how, how does the research of Georgetown faculty advance racial justice what kind of obligations does um, the search for racial justice impose on researchers, you know, recognizing the systemic racism that might be baked into this or that field? And how do we think about that? How do we combat it? How do we make them more inclusive? And then finally, how the pursuit of justice in informs, um, you know, the impact of the speaker's work. And that's why I think event events like this are so important, because we're a university, so we have to do specialized research. Some of that specialized research is only going to be legible to other specialists. But then we have to create fora like these where the results of that research, the impulses behind it, can then be shared among ever larger publics. So I'm just really happy to be here. I'm super grateful to our participants um, who will be introduced in a moment. Um, Scott Taylor from SFS, Gwen Michael um, from the college, Terrence Johnson from the college. But I guess I'm most grateful to all, to my, my friend and colleague, uh, as they say, Professor Soika Colbert, um, also our Vice Dean of Faculty, who's really been the prime mover um, behind all of this. I want to thank all of you two for attending. I'm going to turn it over now uh, to you, Soika, so that you can begin to introduce the speakers and introduce the event. Thank you so much, Dean Chalenza. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's session. As Chris mentioned, this series emerged in response to the racial violence, the anti-Black violence that has unfolded this summer, but draws attention to our faculty's much longer consideration of racial justice and the university's roles in advancing it. We will explore how the work of the university may be mobilized for such a time as this. Our first speaker is Professor of Anthropology and Foreign Service, 
and interim chair of anthropology, Gwendolyn Michael. She served as director of, African, of the African Studies Program in the School of Foreign Service and has helped to develop the program since 1982. She has also served as the chair of the Department of Sociology and has previously chaired, served as the chair of anthropology. She was senior fellow for African studies at the Council on Foreign Relations from 2000 to 2003. She also served as the co-director of the Racial Justice Institute Planning Committee at Georgetown University. She holds the distinction of being the first black person promoted to full professor on the main campus. She is the author of numerous articles and two books, Coco and Chaos in Ghana and African Feminism, The Politics of Survival in Sub-Saharan Africa. Our second panelist, Terrence L. Johnson, is an associate professor of religion and politics in the Department of Government and a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. He is an affiliate member of the Departments of African American Studies and Theology and Religious Studies. He is the author of Tragic Soul Life, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Moral Crisis Facing American Democracy, and serves as co-editor of the Duke University Press series, Religious Cultures of African and African Di Diaspora People. He is busily at work on a second monograph entitled, We Testify With Our Lives, Black Power and the Ethical Turn in Politics. Today's conversation will be moderated by Professor Scott Taylor, who is also of the Vice Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the School of Foreign Service. He is also the author of four books, Politics in Southern Africa, Transition and Transformation, with Gretchen Buer, Culture and Customs of Zambia, Business and the State in Southern Africa, the Politics of Economic Reform, and globalization in the cultures of business in Africa. In Africa. We are grateful that today's conversation is co-sponsored by the School of Foreign Service. I'll now turn things over to Professor Taylor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Colbert. Uh, and thank you, Dean Chalenza, uh, for sponsoring and hosting this event. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you all for attending this afternoon. It's, uh, without further ado, I wanna turn over to our two uh, panelists. And uh, we've asked them to consider as we start out this afternoon um, and thinking about racial justice and the, the role of racial justice in the university. First, to tell us a little bit about your, um, your research um, and, and also, ways in which your research uh, advances racial, racial justice, um, and then and think about the role of the university uh, in that. We can explore some of that in the Q&A in a little bit more detail, but I'd, I'd ask uh, each of you to give a, a brief uh, overview of your work from those perspectives, and um, I, I think we start with seniority and uh, <laughs> my esteemed colleague, <laughs> Professor Michael. So go ahead, please. We got to unmute you. I'm really pleased to be a part of this, um, of this panel today. Um, Dean Chalenza's comments about the overlap between all of these movements for racial justice and anti-police violence and all of this um, marks the fact that this is a really special time. Um, and it reminds me of having uh, developed a consciousness and then developed professionally during an earlier time of um, protests and organization for racial justice. Um, I have uh, been pursuing notions of racial justice, both in terms of the international stage, um, looking at um, the development of, of um, African countries and, and how in fact they were reshaping themselves after colonialism. I have focused on um, feminist movements in Africa and looked at the ways in which women fought to reposition themselves within the politics of their own societies. But most recently, I have been looking at um, the 
civil rights movements that I grew up in and examining those uh, in terms of what the impact that the 64 and 65 civil rights legislation had on um, educational stratification, particularly on the south side of Chicago. I narrowed in my research to look at some of that. So in a sense, I'm trying to bring anthropology back home uh, and move in my more recent work uh, toward looking at the ways in which we can examine um, the experiences of people like me, a cohort like me, that um, were in the Chicago educational system during the civil rights legislation and who became a part of that first cohort. And I say first cohort because many um, of the major institutions only had one or two students who were black or of color uh, in the classes prior to this time. But um, I'm interested now in examining the experiences of this cohort uh, that moved into the universities in larger numbers um, in looking at the role of black teachers who were responsible for preparing students um, for what they knew was coming, which was the opening up of these institutions because of the pressure. But what has not been previously explored is how important the role of those teachers were in doing this. Um, particularly, if I take Chicago as my example, my research example, on the south side of Chicago, in two high schools like Inglewood and um, Parker High School, which I attended. And it was extremely important because the teachers were determined that when that legislation actually passed, they would have a cohort of students to push through the doors as the doors opened. Um, many of these students largely succeeded. When you look back at that group that they had prepared, they went on to make, um, to go to graduate school after they finished college and to make uh, major contributions to national life and to the professions. And at the same time, the neighborhoods out of which these students came, um, neighborhoods that were already redlined and deprived of economic opportunity, were then deprived of the contributions that these students um, could have made because they often went off to other places and stayed. I went off to Columbia and then to Georgetown and stayed. And um, there has been a growing awareness among my cohort, and we've talked about this when we meet, about the impact we could have made had we stayed and ways in which it is our responsibility now to contribute to racial justice for those communities. I'm sure you're aware of a number of scholars who have um, examined the crises that occurred in these neighborhoods um, and they have focused on the class and the economic dynamics of survival uh, in the 70s and in the 80s. Um, but not enough attention has been focused on um, the professional success or failure of that cohort of 6465. Um, and so my research has been to literally track down members of this cohort in these two schools. And I chose these two schools because they were competitor schools on the south side. But turning out members of that cohort that I would encounter at the University of Chicago. And in other cities, those kinds of schools would have been turning out people that many of you may have encountered. So um, I deviate from the work of a person like Sherry Ortner, who examined her high school, um, a largely Jewish cohort, in, I'm gonna mispronounce it, Wequawkick, New Jersey. And she looked, she tracked them, she looked at the experiences they'd had in high school and at their careers. But she was starting off recognizing that this was a privileged, relatively privileged group. 
On the other hand, I am um, exploring the dynamics that pushed our cohort forward, the differentiation between the teachers in these high schools, uh, white teachers who had been there before and the larger number of black teachers who were entering, who formed the core of that effort to create such a cohort. I'm looking at um, the racial dynamics of success among their students. I'm looking at the future of these two high schools in the 70s and 80s, and then the implications of staying or leaving, what those implications had for the life outcomes of that 64-65 cohort. The theme that emerges from um, my research then is um, the how racial prejudice plays out in the institutions to which the cohort went, my cohort went, um, how that affected their uh, climb up the professional ladder, what roles mentoring played for them in the process of their, their climb, in my case, and for a large number of my cohort, it's within the universities. Uh, and so what uh, role mentorship played in their ability to climb in that environment. And I'm asking the question about whether in retrospect, they would make the same professional choices or different professional choices, given what they have experienced along the way. Um, it's interesting that um, I assumed based on what I had seen of my cohort within the University of Chicago, that major educational institutions would have large numbers of people like us. And arriving at Georgetown found that it wasn't so. And that a major challenge then for us who were coming into institutions like this would be to encourage diversity. Um, both at the student level and at the faculty level. Um, so a second theme in my research has been looking at socioeconomic stratification and class as it's been experienced for this cohort, both in, farm, in terms of their family dynamics as well as the collegial dynamics in the areas where they are residing. Asking questions like, what were the, why were the experiences of um, Southside members of my cohort so different from the experiences of the West Side students who were at the same age? Um, I'm asking questions about how my cohort was chosen by those top universities into which we went and what profiles they were using to choose members of um, our cohort. I'm looking at um, what percentage of my group were first gen. I appreciate Georgetown's uh, support for that notion of first generation. It's been enormously helpful to uh, people like me who were first generation then. It's helpful to those students now who are first generation to know that we've been through similar experiences. I'm looking at um, the cohesion of our cohort, the ways in which by working together, we've been able to work on larger projects of diversity across the country. And I'm looking at what I call re-engagement, returning to work in the communities that we came from, not necessarily to live there, but to engage and to network and to pass on some of the benefits of uh, being in the kinds of educational environments that we're in, pass on some of those to high school students and junior college students uh, in the places from which we came. Members of my cohort are almost unanimously convinced that it is the responsibility of the university, not just to create diversity in the student body as Georgetown has done, and now in the faculty as Georgetown is now doing 
it's not just that, but to support also the kinds of research that um, people like us will be doing on diversity issues, to support it not just in terms of the financing of some of our research grants and that sort of thing, but also to support it by allowing us to take that research into the classroom, to teach the courses that pass on some of that information, that provide students today who are looking at Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-racism movements, to provide them with um, some up close and personal experiences of members of that earlier cohort for whom that civil rights um, struggle was the movement we were engaged in. And doing this, I find that doing this, one way I can do this is by engaging students in some of the research that I'm doing, allowing them to do some of the interviewing of members of my cohort, allowing them to build a product that they put together a DVD in most cases, or a PowerPoint presentation that allows them to showcase things they have gained, information they have gained about this cohort as they did some of the work. And it's fascinating because sometimes they focus in on, on things I would not have been inclined to notice uh, up front and personal, and it's great when they do because it says they're coming at it with fresh eyes and they're asking questions about phenomena they've studied maybe in other courses and they're looking at how it does or does not play out here. And so it's enormously beneficial both for them and for me, and I'll go one step further, and for the members of my cohort that they are interviewing because they too get to interface with the kinds of students that we have here at Georgetown. So in many ways, I think that by adding to the diversity, faculty diversity here, we are educating a group of students whose experiences inform some of what we are doing and broaden our perspectives on some of what we're doing. I'm going to stop there and let you come back to me with in questions. Thank you very much, Professor Michael, um, yeah, for that. Uh overview of your work and especially um, your new work it's uh it's fascinating and look forward to um, asking about it and learning more about it uh now we turn to professor terrence johnson so uh terrence i wonder if you take up these these same questions you know tell us a, a little bit about your work and 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 particularly how this issue of racial justice is 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 integrated within it uh, no, thank you, Scott. You know, I first want to just uh, really thank uh, Soika for sort of grounding the whole um, webinar in, in Esther, because when I looked at the title, uh, you know, it just took me back to uh, my childhood and to my grandmother's church. And I remember listening to these Black women consistently say, you know, Sunday after Sunday, you know, if I go to the king, you know, I perish, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to the king. And it wasn't until I prepared for today's talk that I looked back and I was like, oh, there's a line that they didn't, didn't say all the time. It's like, even, even, if it, even though I'm breaking the law, I am going to the king. And what's really fascinating is that when we look at African-American studies, um, you know, it's, it, it really emerged by breaking the law. And my work really looks at the ways in which African-Americans have attempted to insert themselves, not only in the legal system, right, but also in the religious and moral traditions. And I think most of us forget that our presence here at this, at this very moment, right, is this idea of we've defied the law. And so what, what are the implications of that? And so my two recent projects um, really kind of wrestle with those kinds of things. First project, um, Blacks and Jews, an introduction to a dialogue I just completed, co-wrote it with um, my colleague Jacques Villeneblau here at Georgetown that will come out um, in the fall with Georgetown University Press. And I just completed, uh, we testify with our lives, which would come out uh, next spring as well with uh, Columbia. And in both instances with Blacks and Jews, I'm really looking at this whole historic issue around why are Americans in particular fascinated with these two particular groups. And we think that unlike any other groups in, in the US history, 
people have a certain kind of uh, fascination, certain kind of romanticism about these two groups. Um, and so we really explore that. And what's interesting is that with the whole Charlottesville incident, right? I assume that people were there to really protest immigration, you know, protest all these quote unquote, you know, foreigners coming to the, to, to the US. But in fact, their, you know, their mantra was blacks and Jews will not replace us. And so this whole idea that um, blacks and Jews remain right at the very sort of tip, right, of white supremacists, I think is really worth exploring. So we sort of explore that in, in our text. And then my second project really looks at the ways in which black power, which is often defined as either sort of this nationalist kind of moment or as our new colleague, not new, but our um, colleague, um, Joseph Pino argues is a part of the whole democratic system and a part of democracy. I argue that in many respects, I think black power is sort of pushing even the very limits of democracy and recognizing that the very problem of anti-blackness, right? Almost really prevents African Americans from, from, from being really inscribed into the democratic system. And so therefore they begin to turn to third world politics and begin to imagine themselves as a part of a global community. Right, they reinsert this idea of black internationalism as a way to think through what I call human rights activism and what um, I found in archives, what the people were called, they called humanistic nationalism. And which really interestingly enough actually is borrowed or at least in conversation with Martin Buber in terms of thinking about early forms of Zionism. So what we see is, you know, African Americans struggling to write themselves into, you know, the US fabric legally, religiously, morally. And, and constantly being told, no, you can't be a part of this fabric. And so black power, particularly the SNCC, um, sort of the, the left members of, of, of SNCC began to say, well, let's think about this in a global context. What would it mean for us to align ourselves with, the sort of, with, with folks of color from around the world and to see sort of anti-blackness as sort of a human rights crisis? So that, that's my work. Well, thank you both. So I, I, in this section, I, I want to, um, pose a question to both of you myself. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get your responses to that, but I also wanna ask members of the audience, if you have uh, questions for either of the panelists, please, um, you can uh, send questions to via the uh, Q&A function uh, on your page and we'll try to get those, those questions in as well. So thank you both for, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by y your, you're very different work, um, but at the, 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 there are many intersections to discover here and to, to unpack. Um, Terrence just brought up the, you know, the, the, the third world politics of, of black internationalism. And I wanna use that as, as an entry point for discussion. And maybe my bias is coming from the SFS a little bit, but I do, I, I do wanna uh, you know, think about this in a, in a broader um, international context. I mean, you know, uh, 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 Terence writes in one of his articles, for example, on Malcolm X uh, about abolition ethics calls for political agents to engage the lived world, not simply through rational debates on justice, but by joining movements and involving themselves in transnational political struggles. Um, that I think resonates with his notion of, of what he just raised about um, um, the, the sort of quest for a larger black, a larger African community. And both of you have engaged um, Terrence through his work on Du Bois and Malcolm X and his new work and Gwen through you know, your, your entire career and the, your teaching on, on diasporas and now your fascinating new work here close to home in Chicago in a, in a real pan-Africanist sort of pan-black kind of um, scope. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to, as you think about that, both sort of this diasporic, um, you know, African diaspora and Pan-Africanism and, and sort of the, its broadest um, lenses. Mm -hmm. If you think about racial justice right. in that sense and, and this, the, to what extent is this quest for racial justice that we are so gripped with here in the U.S. now, as we have been for so long, but uh, you know, culminating in, in the, the, these events of, of the summer and indeed here at Georgetown. To what extent, do, how do we see the intersection between the struggle for racial justice, for you know, an anti-racist agenda here in the U.S. with this sort of international dimensions that both of you have, have 
you know, worked very much on. Where, what are the connections? How can we learn from each other? How can we, how do we build a, a truly global movement? Well, let me take a stab at that. Um, one of the things I've seen is that um, in a place like Ghana, where I've done a lot of work, uh, there's been a growing awareness of the fact that the colonialism they experienced was similar to in many ways, and certainly the outcomes of it are similar to the kinds of uh, racial discrimination that African Americans uh, had faced. There had been for a long time an unwillingness to think about those situations as comparable. But the younger generation of folk have been systematically doing that. And so I've started to get questions from uh, people outside the academy. Why are we now seeing movements um, against racism or movements against discrimination on university campuses in a place like Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa? Why are we seeing them and they're verbalizing the connection that they feel with the Black Lives Matter movement? and with the anti-police violence movement. And I think it's because the, um, we were more exposed to each other. We now remember that historically, many of the leaders, our early um, civil rights leaders, were talking to each other. From Du Bois on, we're talking with um, people who were leading, playing leadership roles in Africa and in the Caribbean. And so now they are making the comparisons and saying, maybe we need to be adopting some of the tactics of those movements that could apply equally well here where there has been, here in Africa, where there has been class domination or ethnic domination. And so I think people are seeing on all sides of these oceans, we're seeing these movements come closer and closer together and how they conceptualize that oppression and how they respond to it. No, I think that's a great, great point, Gwen. And you know, you're right. I mean, it, it dates back to, to Du Bois and to Williams, who's doing research right in the Congo, who's, who's really saying what you know um, King Leopold is doing. It's a human rights violation in terms of the, so the, the tragic tragedy over in, in the Congo. And so, I think part of this whole quest has been, on the one hand, to find a home. Right, African Americans desperately wanted a place to call home. I think part of it has to do with this whole, part of the whole American machination around Israel, right? In terms of the U.S. is this new Israel, and then African Americans saying, "Well, maybe it's not my new Israel." But then using that point as a connection, right? Not only to Israel as a geography, but in terms of um, globally thinking about where does Ethiopia, where does Egypt, sort of stand in that, and making those connections. Um, and I do think it goes also back to this third point around how African Americans have historically read text. And, you know, well before Foucault, right, in terms of, you know, um, post-structuralism, in terms of, you know, Judith Butler performance theory, when, when slaves encounter the Bible, right, they literally, there's this encounter where the slave said, I saw the book talking. And when he saw this book talking, he's like, I want, I want the book to talk to me. And there's a scholar named Vincent Wilbush who argues that this then becomes, along with Henry Louis Gates, this idea of the talking book tradition, right? In which African Americans sort of look at the Bible, not simply as a text to go in and to sort of reify who they are in a very strict sense, but to try to find a way out of a problem. And so they use text then not to close, but to open up. And I think that kind of hermeneutical approach is often ignored. And I think that's how so many African Americans were able to say, okay, my problem that I have here in Boston, whether with, you know, with, with Trotter, is also connected to what's happening in Liberia, what's happening in South Africa. And so I think that whole religious connection, which I don't, I don't say everything is religious, but I do think that hermeneutical approach has really played into Africa, how African Americans read, right? And it's always about, more often than not, right, how do we read to open up the text? And so, and I'm working on a project now that looks at even how people are reading the Constitution as something that's a living document. And it's more than living, it's actually talking to you. And what does that mean to people who are originalists who say, no, I simply want to preserve the text as it is. And I think it's a very different approach for slaves who were not educated, right? But who use their, educated in a traditional sense, but who use their own, you know, resources 
epistemic resources sort of think through these crazy moments. And I think that's sort of the beauty, right, of having people who study African American studies, who do Africana stuff, because um, we bring multiple worlds to the table. And yeah, I went back to the point that, again, it was, it was never simply about writing a book for your colleagues, right? It was always about you write the book for your colleagues so that your people can get liberated. So all the things that Gwen talked about, Du Bois is talking about, right? I mean, clearly Harriet Tubman is actually doing. Um, we have Ella Baker doing this, right, in the 60s. And so, I mean, I, yeah, so anyway, so I, I think it's sort of a remarkable moment, but, but I think that whole reading piece is really interesting to think through in terms of what, what would it mean for us, not only as a university, but as a country to think about these sacred texts as something that are, that are actually talking texts. And what would it mean then for us to engage a talking text Right. I think it would say a whole lot about our tradition, a whole lot about in terms of, you know, whether or not are we willing to lose something when we encounter this text? Mm -hmm. Right. What do we gain when we encounter the text? And so I think this particular approach really is a game changer, particularly for people who have re been reading in, I would say, silos. Mm -hmm. It's really would you say the same thing about your own work, Terrence, that you, you know, you write this book for your for your people to achieve liberation is that is that also one of your own motivations or do you see your work instead as kind of advancing racial justice as a consequence of what you're arguing in the book rather than as a, 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 a normative motivation sure you know it, it's interesting you raise that question because i would argue that early on I wanted to write as a scholar, right? I mean, because I, you know, and in part because Morehouse taught me and went to Morehouse College, look, you want to be the very best and you want to always push boundaries. And what I realized is that it doesn't matter what you write, they're always going to see you as a black scholar. <laughs> and so I don't have a grandiose view of like wanting to save my people, but I think in the last couple of years, I've wanted to reclaim a voice that I heard at Morehouse and that I, I want to reclaim and say, no, this is an important voice. And, and, and when you speak from that voice, right, I think that is where the freedom will come. Um, you know, um, I, I've been looking at Tony Gay Bambara and her work on salt eaters and thinking through that in terms of what does it mean to have these sort of people who are engaged in these very, you know, esoteric religious practices, but who are also very political. And, and part of what I learned is this whole idea that, you know, we need people who are cultural workers, right, who will help translate, right, for people what's happening. And, um, you know, and I don't want to claim that I want to liberate people, but I want people to find meaning because that's what I'm trying to find in my work. And I'm really trying to reclaim, right, this whole idea that, you know, we're here for this transformative moment. And I think sometimes when you're in these sort of elite institutions, we're so used to teaching, quote unquote, really good students that we, we forget that there are other places that actually teach for yeah. transformative purposes, that people come to actually to be transformed. And often when we come to these elite institutions, we, we come to sort of, you know, get credentialed. But of late, I've been thinking, wow, at Howard and Morehouse and the Spellmans of the world, you actually go because you want to become a better person. And so I'm trying to bring that into the classroom and say, look, you guys, yeah, you're smart, but do you want to remain the same person or do you want some transformative moment? And that I think is also really key in terms of thinking through these big problems. And again, what does transformation look like? I don't know, but I can't do it the old way in terms of I just go in the classroom and have a conversation. It has to be about some something that's actually going to light a fire. Good. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, 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 I'll turn to um, some of the questions that are coming through on the chat. So let me, um, one, and I, I think really, you know, this is, emerges out of something that you just said, Terrence, but a question that applies to that, that both of you I'd like to answer is, is um, who do you think of as your audience for your work? Um, yeah, and, and, and to maybe dovetail on my own question a moment ago, um, uh, Gwen, especially as you now have kind of transitioned, come home back to sort of an American uh, focus in your research and, 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 and maybe similar kinds of questions, but, but a very different scope of research than that on which you spent much of your career. Yeah. Um, who do you think of as the, as the audience for your work, as your first audience? Well, obviously you'll have a scholarly audience you hope you're going to, but I am more concerned with the audience 
that comes out of the kinds of communities that we came out of. Uh, ones who did not necessarily go to the kinds of institutions we have gone to, but who can see the impact of what happened to us and learn about more about what was going on at various stages of these movements. Um, they are not, I want a readership that is not necessarily comfortable with my leaving, um, but that hopes to gain additional knowledge about various places and experiences from my own experiences or from the experiences of my cohort. I want them to be able to um, answer some of the questions that are in their minds, such as why were you chosen and not others? And so I'm really looking for that, um, that black um, public, that Hispanic public, that non-white public that reads the work in different ways and asks questions that come out of their own experiences, which may differ slightly or, or greatly from the ones my cohort has had. That's the readership I really want. But that means you have to write in a way that brings that information, that makes it accessible, and that uh, encourages a questioning that, you know, your, your, your elite colleagues might not do, but they will do. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'm going to follow up with that again, but uh, Terrence, go ahead, please. I mean, think about that question of audience and 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 to whom you're you, to whom you're speaking primarily. If the you know, when you think about that. Yeah, you know, you know, I would say you know, after with COVID and you know Brown and Taylor and, and so the resurgence of BLM, I I, I really feel way more compelled to think about a broader audience and, um, and, and not to become a public intellectual or like, you know, go on television, but actually um, really talk to people and, and, and try to listen to what's happening in their lives and, and really try to do the kind of sort of the reporting, but also the analysis that I think that we need to understand um, communities that are always, you know, just ignored. Um, and, you know, so I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm really sort of trying to broaden sort of my, my, my base, right? And, and really think um, about what's happening on the ground and really think about what would it, I mean, what does it mean to, to be disruptive and to break the law, right? And I don't know what that looks like. I mean, I, mean, I do in terms of history, but in terms of my own work, you know, I, I do want to um, push the envelope more because I realized just sitting in my office writing for a promotion or writing for a few people, it really does a disservice, right, to to my grandmother, right, to all those people who clean white people's homes, right, who made it possible for me to, you know, to get to this moment, right, and yeah, I, so and again, I've always done like minor stuff, but it's, it's I, I think now there's a greater kind of calling, and um, and I think I just have to kind of work from like kind of work in my own zone, like you know, just go deeper, and and I, and I think it will slowly kind of. Um, evolve and, be, and, and become kind of known to me. Sometimes I, I, I'm a little slow on the buttons here. Um, thank you for that. I, 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 I appreciate both of your answers. Um, and I, I just want to say for the record that both of you would look very good on TV if you choose to, <laughs> choose to contribute shooting. in that form. <laughs> We're not shooting for that. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it, there's a question that's come through on the chat that I, that I want to ask. I want to maybe add my own um, uh, addendum to it. And, and, and the question, uh, just read it as written. Um, what are the challenges and possibilities of doing racial justice work at Georgetown uh, in particular, or at the university in general and Georgetown in particular, given its, its Jesuit tradition and given its own history? And, then, uh, and my own um, adjunct to that question would be, 
you know, especially you, Gwen, looking back on the, the, the many decades that you've spent at this institution and all the, the changes and lack of changes that you've seen in that time. Um, so, so one is kind of, one is asking about racial justice work and particularly your research and, and how that's, uh, how that's made more difficult or more easy given the constraints and the Jesuit traditions of Georgetown. But then also I would like you to think about the road um, traveled thus far and at, at the risk of biting the hand that feeds us, uh, you know, talk about where we need to go as an institution. Um, uh, so, so beyond the sort of research, but about the practicalities of, you know, SFS, for example, has just adopted an anti-racist agenda as sort of a core principle. What does that mean? How do we get there? What do you, what do you think about, you know, especially, uh, I'd like to hear from both of you about what are, what are the obstacles yet in our way? Uh, if I, well, I'm, I've got one foot in each school. Um, and so it's been interesting for me to compare the experiences across that. Um, I think that earlier in the college, there um, was a real questioning about whether the work you're doing on black communities or on black movements was that as valid as other kinds of work that would be done by your colleagues in that discipline. Um, a lot of that has become easier now because there is um, greater understanding of the importance of work that represents various parts of the world or how these justice issues are explored in various parts of the world. So within the uh, college, I find uh, it's easier to take on this kind of research now than it would have been, than it was um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, we have an African-American studies department now, but even though I had taught um, courses, I'd helped to shape an African-American and African studies program at Rutgers University before coming to Georgetown. That wasn't possible here at Georgetown uh, when I first came, because there wasn't the understanding of the importance of it, of the authenticity of the research, of whether it was valuable to other people. That consciousness has grown, and so I'm, I'm pleased with that. If I look at the School of Foreign Service, they were very much aware of the contribution that my kind of research could make to their understanding of international affairs or of the Foreign Service. They were aware of those kinds of things. They were not as conscious of the need for um, diversity in faculty members. So for example, um, although I was the first um, tenure, tenured uh, or tenured line um, black professor in uh, the core faculty of SFS, um, it took, oh my God, how many years did it take? <laughs> until you came, Scott. <laughs> Literally, until I decided that the Africa program was going to be a place where more scholars came in who um, represented other parts of the world. And so it's been slow, SFS has been slow to have that diversity increase in its core faculty members. Um, and I am hopeful that it's picking up now. <laughs> I can see the change. I can see the importance of um, the selection for you to be um, the vice dean for diversity you know, within the school. Um, we're, we're making steps. Our, re, our work is being acknowledged in ways that wouldn't have happened before. In terms. No, you know, I think I focus my, my response like on sort of the undergrads. And I think places like Georgetown, right, do a great job of bringing very interesting people 
but I think we have to do a better job in terms of thinking about the intellectual life uh, of our students and the, and the culture that we create. I find that in my classrooms, you know, they're all racially divided, depending on the, the title. If I have philosophy in my title, it's generally, you know, a wider class. If I don't have it in my title, it's not. And um, I find that people, my students still think, they don't talk about the whole, you know, slavery piece at Georgetown. I have freshmen this year who are like, oh yeah, I sort of know about that. And so I, I think we're not, we're celebrating racial justice, right? In a way that it's still tied to an identity and it's not tied to say knowledge production. Um, and my mentor, Lewis Gordon has always emphasized this idea. And I'm not reading black people to know about their experiences. I'm reading black people to find out how, what do they think about tragedy? What do they think about love? And, you know, I think we have to do a better job in terms of when our students come, one, how do we make sure they have a, a rigorous sort of, you know, um, background and, and a set of courses to take? Uh, and that also, they all feel compelled to sort of take some of these classes. And then when they take these classes, how do they, when will they talk to each other? And I teach a co-teacher class on Blacks and Jews in America. It's always usually evenly divided, but we struggle with in terms of getting the students to talk to each other after after class because it's kind of like oh, okay once they realize they see a connection or they see the historical sort of wrongs in terms of christianity okay we, we're, we're kind of stuck and we need an institution to help us think through what does it mean then when you have a diverse sort of classroom folk who say okay i, I see something new i hear something new what do you do and most people say oh interesting course and they go on about their business and i think structurally we have to do a better job of making sure our students are engaged but but don't see the race or the gender thing or trans as this sort of separate piece, but as sort of fundamental, right, to who we are, you know, as, as a university. And, you know, and I, I think it's sad that our, that our students just don't really talk to each other. I mean, they come and they, they stay in their groups. And I think, you know, they spend all this money. Why are you here if you're not going to engage so-called so -called difference? That you, you, these students write this in their application, but then when they come, it's like, okay, you know, it's like business as usual. So I think we have to do a better job of getting our students to really to talk to each other cross-culturally, you know, cross genders and religions. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, uh, there's, a, there's another question in the chat I want to turn to, but really maybe if you might respond just really quickly to this one, Terrence, is, is uh, whose fault is that? Ours or theirs or both? And, how to, and, and what are the mechanisms that you see to get those conversations started? I would say that it's our fault because you know um, we're older. We, you know, you know, you know. We we know, right? We all have experience, right? We we, we know what this place is like, and so these students are kind of naive. They're not sure. I mean, they're really smart, but how do you like break through eighteen years of like, okay, I've only gone to school, mm -hmm. right? At you know, with, with a certain group of people, right? It's all it's always you know racially divided. I mean, I've only lived in the middle, upper middle class neighborhood. What do you tell these? What do you tell these kids? And I think structurally we've got to find a way to sort of break those divides and i think we are responsible because we claim that oh we we want diversity at our university okay well what do we do when we, we bring them here i want to agree with what uh, terence is saying i noticed those kinds of divides in my classroom but but we're we're doing anthropology and so what i decided to do was to put together research teams and to make sure those teams were integrated with students who came from different backgrounds so that they had to work together and they were contributing to the growth in knowledge of both of them, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whatever. They were forced to listen to each other, to grapple with the issues. I discovered that some students wanted to back away from that one-on-one -on -one interviewing of non-white um, subjects. And I had to find a way to kind of make sure that they were also doing some of that work so that they didn't have the luxury of backing away and not directly engaging the material. The, tool, the, the tools of anthropology are perhaps uniquely suited to that kind of inquiry. One point, I had a student, you know, great guy, tell me, look, I'm Asian American. I don't see where I fit in terms of the black white divide. Mm -hmm. And I pushed back and said, well, I mean, you look at legal cases, right? Mm -hmm. Asian Americans fought for citizenship in part by arguing we're not black. 
So mm -hmm. therefore put us in the white category. So there's all these sort of histories, right, that people just don't know. And you feel as if, again, BLM is like, that's their, that's their issue. Mm -hmm. And we've got to do a better way structurally, institutionally, say, no, this is not their issue. This is an issue that we help create. And now we got to figure out how to undo it. But it, it can't just be in the context of courses because courses are, by their nature, self-selecting, at least among electives, right? And so we're not reaching perhaps the people who most need to be reached on all sides of these issues, right? And, and we need to, to develop the kind of mechanisms that, that really builds the inclusive community um, that we're all advocating. Uh, let me turn to the, to the chat. There's um, uh, a question, uh, very contemporary. Um, do you see any possible divergence in the short term and intermediate in regard to racial justice based upon the results of this upcoming election? My goodness. <laughs> so, well, I have to go back to Alicia. Okay, turn start. Yeah. Oh, I'm go sorry, what you say? No, 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 go ahead, and then, and then we'll turn to Gwen. Oh, I'm sorry, Gwen. Um, you know, many of my colleagues, a, a lot of Black feminists are arguing that we have to rethink even the language we're using, right? And to say that this is not about repairing a system, but, right? But it's about a system that is, was designed in a certain way and is functioning, right, based on that design. And I think it's hard for us to kind of swallow that because, again, I grew up, you know, in the tradition of politics flexibility at Morehouse where, you know, you go in, you wear your suit, and no matter what they throw at you, you keep, you keep fighting, right? And but you fight with your head held high, you, you speak well, all that kind of stuff. And now to actually really think about what the feminists have been saying, right, for the last 30 years, in terms of black feminists, in terms of Alice Walker, in particular, and Tony K. Von Barr, it, it's hard to say then why I work at a place that institutionally was not designed for African Americans. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Even in our great efforts to transform it, what does it mean that structurally, and, and that's where I'm stuck, because there are a lot of structures, right, just not designed for our bodies. And I think that's, you know, that's the conversation we're all, we're all dealing with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go on, please. Well, you asked about the election. <laughs> and I should, I should warn you that you, you can't say all you want to say about the election, <laughs> uh, only because we're, 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 at, we're nearly at the end of our time, so. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with what Terrence was saying. I also think that um, it's going to be more difficult for many of the, in, not necessarily for our university. We have tried to withstand that pressure from outside to limit support for these movements, so to limit this conversation about race. Um, but I think that it's going to be harder for some of the organizations that we work with um, to continue having it's not going to stop. It's just going to be, depending on who, who wins the election, avenues are going to be closed off for funding or for, you know, what they can and cannot do. Um, or for the kinds of, of um, dangers that our students who are engaged in movements will be experiencing. Um, and so it's been a bit jolting for me to hear uh, friends ask the question, uh, what country do you think you'll go to if things turn out badly <laughs> in the coming election? Where will you go? Meaning it won't be the kind of place that we would have wanted to live in. And so therefore, what would we do? I don't, I try not to take those questions seriously. No, my but my eight-year-old son is like, Daddy, can we move to Toronto? Yeah, yeah. I, or, or, or go, go back to Spain or something. He's like, what are we going to do? Yeah, I think yeah. a number of people, they don't realize it is a real threat, right? When your president doesn't denounce white supremacy and it tells yeah. people, hey, get ready, stand by, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people are terrified. Renew that passport. Yeah, and so, you know, the, the questions of racial justice are urgent now. <laughs> Imagine what they might look like um, yep. you know, with the with the reelection. Um, I, I I wish we had time to. There there's so much more, and and um, this is such a rich discussion. I wish we had time to to go on more.
Um, I have so many more questions. I know there are other questions from our audience participants, but um, I, I've been instructed by my colleague, uh, Dean Colbert, that I have to keep it to an hour. So we are out of time. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Dean Colbert for inviting me to moderate this first discussion uh, and thank Dean Chilenza for, um, for um, sponsoring and hosting us. Um, but I particularly want to thank my colleagues, Gwen Michael and Terrence Johnson, um, for an extremely enriching conversation. Um, it's been a privilege to, to have you as colleagues and to have this opportunity to interact with you over these critical issues. So um, thank you all. I just will have uh, one announcement. The, this series will continue next week, um, same time at noon next Wednesday. And you should refer to the website for additional information. Uh, on behalf of all my colleagues, thanks for joining us.